So welcome back. I hope you had a short break. Um, this lecture um, is gonna um, give some kind of an excursion to uh, higher topos theory in, um, in type theory. And we're gonna do homotopy pushouts, homotopy pullbacks, and descent theorem. But we, uh, it's gonna be more a high level talk because um, there's just too much. So um, I hope you uh, get a sense of what's important about, um, about this homotopy uh, co limits. Um, but um, yeah, if you want to actually uh, work with them, then probably you have to. To find a, um, a reference to 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 find more details about it <clears throat> and proofs. Uh, I'm not gonna do proofs here so much. Um, let's see. Does this work? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we have discussed the idea of higher inductive types and one example, the circle. Um, and the idea is now that many spaces in topology are constructed by attaching cells, like CW complexes, if you've heard about those. And, um, and now we can try in homotopy type theory to, um, uh, to, to do those constructions in a synthetic way in homotopy type theory using higher inductive types. That's a valid question. And actually, for many CW complexes, it's an open problem whether you actually can can do it, or um, just the fact that no one has formalized, like the Grassmannians, for example. Those are very well known CW complexes, but no one can uh, seems to be able to to implement this as them as higher inductive types. But uh, uh, some of them we can, and we'll see today the spheres, the suspensions. Um, and so on. They are all um, uh, all definable in homotopy type theory. And these, uh, even in topology, when you construct them by attaching cells, they are satisfying a universal property. And that universal property uh, can be uh, uh, turned into a, uh, into a homotopy universal property even. Uh, and that's good for us, but because that means that we can do it in, in homotopy type theory. The problem in homotopy type theory is that you can only ever say things that are invariant in their homotopy. There are no things that you, um, that are not invariant in their homotopy. Those are evil <coughs> in hot from our perspective, not, not in topology. Um, so we'll see some basic constructions and, uh, and the properties. And the most important a uh, general construction in homotopy type theory is that of homotopy pushouts. They are defined as a higher inductive type. And this starting data is, is this span of maps. You have S here, so S means span, uh, and the map F from S to A and the map G from the same S to B. Then if you, if you have that, you can take the pushout of F and G. And this will be a new type uh, written like, oops, what's going on? Uh, my computer is not happy. Um, and it fits in a commuting square. And there will be a homotopy that, uh, that fills this square. And, um, and this pushout is a higher inductive type. So it's generated by this map and that map and the homotopy. This is what, what is written here. It's a higher inductive type with two point constructors and one uh, path constructor. Oops, sorry. My, my magic mouse does stuff that I don't want it to do. <clears throat> uh, the point constructors include the points of A and B. And, um, and the path constructor identifies uh, the point constructors if they come from the same point in S. Um, okay, um, uh, and then again, you give it a, a, a dependent universal property or an induction principle that's, that's equivalent. And you can derive then the universal property of it. And the universal property is the universal property of the pushout. <clears throat> and this uh, property says that if I have an arbitrary type X, how do I map out of my pushout into X? 
is I make another commuting square and uh, I make sure that uh, this other square here commutes. Then, um, so I have i, j, and the homotopy. Then I get a unique map h such that this diagram commutes. I didn't write down what it means for this diagram to commute, but there are three pieces of data to that. Uh, first is that the two triangles here commute, uh, but then you have uh, these two triangles. We also know that this square commutes, and uh, we know that the um, the uh, outer uh, square commutes. So the outer square commutes now in two ways from the data. The h says that the outer square commutes, or we can um, like paste these uh, three little um, uh, the square and the triangles together, and we get another way in which the square commutes. And those two ways should be the same. So there should be a homotopy between those homotopies. Um, but uh, but uh, the edge is unique with uh, with this um, with this notion of commutativity. <clears throat> um, there are many examples that you can make. So we're, we're going to study this uh, in this lecture. These homotopy pushouts by example. Oops, and I noticed that this isn't really types as well. So the first observation is that uh, you can turn the circle in, uh, into a pushout. And the pushout has this form. If I, um, uh, so the circle has a base point and these two points map both to the base point. And then, <clears throat> uh, uh, and then I can get uh, two uh, different loops. One is just going to be the loop, but the other one is going to be Ravel. That's what this does. And then you can show that uh, that this is a pushout square. And I should have drawn a picture also, but the idea is that you have these two points, and then you connect these uh, two points with uh, two paths between them. But when you do that, you see that there is a circle appearing. Uh, so that's why uh, this pushout is a circle. Um, we're talking about Schubert cells, okay. <clears throat> and this construction is a special case of the suspension of a type. And uh, the suspension of the type is defined to be a pushout uh, of this kind. So the A and the B that was uh, general in the more general uh, description of pushouts are here just points and the uh, the span is here just the type X. If we take this homotopy pushout, then what happens is we include uh, two base points and x is going into the identity type of, um, of those two base points. So x uh, induces paths from uh, north to south. And the picture here is that um, we have north and south here. The earth is tilted. And, um, and for every point in the space x, we connect uh, north to south with a point that goes through that point. So here's a point, we have a path going through it. Here's another point and the path going through it. Maybe there's a path in X. And then there is a um, paths uh, going through the endpoints, but also something that fills uh, this, that goes through the square. So that's, that's how the suspension works. <clears throat> And um, uh, the suspension are super important in homotopy type theory. And the reason uh, of their importance is that there is an adjunction called the loop space, uh, the suspension loop space adjunction. Uh, because they are kind of the universal way of turning X into, uh, of mapping apps, uh, X into the loop space of something. And, um, so this uh, adjunction is between pointed types and pointed maps. So we have two types and X is equipped with X zero and Y is equipped with Y zero. Then the type of pointed maps is uh, defined as a Sigma type. It's the type of all maps from F, uh, F from X to Y that uh, satisfy this additional or have this additional structure. It's not always a property. Um, that f of x0 is identified with y0. That's a pointed map. And um, 
there's also the definition of loop space. If x is a pointer type, so it has this point zero, uh, x zero, then we define the loop space of x zero to be the type of identifications, x zero to x zero. And it's itself a pointer type because it has raffle. Like I said, it's already at some point. <clears throat> and um, okay, uh, then the uh, adjunction is a theorem. It says that um, that if I map out of the suspension using pointed maps into a pointed type Y, that's the same thing as mapping X into the loop space of Y. So this is really saying that the suspension is the universal way of putting X into the identity type of something. Namely, um, it is, uh, uh, yeah, by this adjunction is, is saying exactly that, okay, X was in the identity type here. We map it to Y, so it will go to the identity type there. Okay, we might as well have equivalently put X directly into the loop space of Y. So how do you prove this? Uh, just by, uh, yes, this is an adjunction. Um, as suspension is the left adjoint. This is a home space. And uh, loop space is the right, right adjoint. Is that enough of a clarification? Okay, um, so I'm, I'm just doing this uh, computation style here. Um, so we start on the, uh, on the left hand side of the, uh, of the claim, pointed maps out of the suspension. We, um, we define this to be the type of all maps that map the base point, which is north to the given point, to the base point of Y. And, uh, um, by the universal property of suspension, <clears throat> remember that it's defined as a certain pushout. This is the same thing as, a, uh, as choosing two points in Y, or equivalently maps from the unit type into Y. But, uh, let's just skip that equivalence. And then a map from X to Y equals Y prime. So this is the commutativity of that square in the um, definition of the suspension. Um, and uh, uh, what happened here? Okay, so y is, is going to be the value of f north and y prime is gonna be the value of f south. Um, so here, what happens from uh, this step to there is that I'm just replacing f, the, f north with, uh, with y. So this is an equivalence just by the universal property of pushouts. Okay, but here we notice that there is a free Y and Y is used in an identity type. So that's contractible data and you can, uh, you can just uh, get rid of it. Whenever in a Sigma type you encounter some combination that's contractible, you just delete all of it. That's, that's how it works. So we get rid of it and then what we get is um, a point uh, Y prime in Y and uh, it also remains the map H from X to um, Y not equals Y prime. Why is this now Y not? Is because we uh, the Y not was the center of contraction of this contractible bit of data. <clears throat> okay, now it's a little trick. Um, we can put in some contractible data now. Uh, we put in a P that goes from Y not to Y prime. And um, mm -hmm. this is not uh, correct. This should be P. Uh, sorry, this should not be raffle. Um, so we put in the P and, uh, and something canonical equals P. So this bit of data is contractible now because we have a free P and it's at the endpoint. Um, of, of some identity type. <clears throat> uh, and uh, this bit remains the same as up there. Okay, but uh, it's also contractible in another way, uh, namely this Y prime with the P, uh, we can cancel it. And now this, what should be P becomes raffle. And, and this really means that we have a base point preserving map from X to the loop space of Y naught, that's what's written here. That's how you 
um, how you derive it in a like calculation style. And uh, a choice of base points could have been south, and yes, then you uh, then you could have done the exact same calculation. And um, yeah, it's an equally um, valid choice of base point. Is omega a monad? Um, yeah, sure. Um, right. I mean, um, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, that's the problem. <clears throat> Thank you, DG Barry. Okay. Uh, oh, I was doing some breaks here. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we have suspensions. And now we define the spheres recursively, starting at a zero, which is uh, the booleans. And uh, then the uh, n plus first sphere is the suspension of the n sphere. And by the loop space uh, suspension adjunction, the type of pointed maps out of the sphere is just the n um, uh, loop space of x, if I iterate the loop space operation. <clears throat> And uh, yeah, this is really nice. If you know some uh, category theory for those who know uh, what this uh, uh, equivalence here means is that the n sphere is a representable, or this um, functor here, the nth loop space is a representable functor and it's represented by the n sphere. And if that means something to you, then, uh, then you can be happy, I suppose. <laughs> Um, so this is really the ends, the n sphere is really the universal n loop. That's how you should think about it. Uh, and that's why this equivalence holds. Okay. There is another operation that you can make with uh, pushouts, and this is the join. This is also a super super important operation. And in the join, we start with uh, a cross B, and we take the two projections. That gives the setting where we can apply the pushout uh, construction. So we take the pushout, we call it the join, and let's look at the constructors. <clears throat> um, so we have uh, the inclusion on the left from A to A join B. We have the inclusion on the right from A to A join B, and glue. The homotopy here says that any point in A and any point in B gets identified. So what this is really is like the bicomplete graph. This picture, um, maybe you've done a course on graph theory and you've drawn this graph with points on, on the left side and point on the right side and you connect just all of them with edges. That's what's going on here in the join. We just include a new identification between any two points on the left with any two point, no, with any one point on the left with any one point on the right. Um, uh, so it's like maximally uh, putting in points as much as possible. <clears throat> and uh, this uh, join operation is going to come back uh, in the construction of the real projective spaces also. So that's why I mention it here. Um, but it's also going to come back here. So there's a theorem that says that there is an equivalence if I join the booleans with x that, that this is this, uh, the suspension of x. So here I drew the picture. I have uh, the booleans on the left, x on the right, and any two points uh, on the left are identified with any two points on the right. So I have these red identifications and the green ones. And I claim that, uh, that this is a suspension. And from the picture, it's kind of clear. I'm not going to do the proof. I'm just going to do the picture. Um, what you should do is just you move the green parts to the right side, and you see that you have drawn a suspension. This is, um, this is that equivalence in pictures. <clears throat> 
and uh, is it not good? <laughs> yes, forbidden magic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you should write a proof assistant that just can do it like that. <laughs> um, here's more theorems that I'm not going to prove. The join is an associative operation. Uh, this is something that uh, Guillaume proved in Act Out. Um, uh, there are two proofs. This is not a proof, even though it says proof. <laughs> um, Guillaume uh, Bruneri proved this in ACTA and uh, maybe some others uh, also. The tree by tree lemma um, is, used, uh, is used to do that. So if you want to um, know how this proof goes, maybe in uh, Guillaume's thesis, he does it <clears throat> with this tree by tree lemma. Uh, and uh, because um, the join is associative, um, well, um, ah, yeah, uh, we get this equivalence from Sn to the n plus first suspension of x, because um, we know that uh, for zero, then this is the booleans. Then, uh, then, uh, then, if I join the booleans with x, then I get the suspension. Um, but we also know that the spheres are uh, are defined as suspensions, iterated suspensions. So if I do S1 here, I know that it is the suspension of S0. And um, and therefore, I know by the previous lemma that it is um, S0 join S0. So here on this left-hand side, I have S0 join S0. And then I'm just doing the associativity. And then I'm using my lemma again. So S0 join S0 join x is the same thing as a zero join suspension of x, which is the same thing as suspension of suspension of x. So as one join x is the double suspension of x and so on. And in the special case where x is a sphere, you get this formula. <clears throat> and this formula, the special case that is interesting to us is as one join as one is equivalent to s3. We're going to see that in a minute coming up. Okay, uh, we did um, uh, push outs, and uh, by duality, we also should have a look at pullbacks. They're the dual notion. So here you start with um, maps f and g going into some type x, and the pullback is, um, is defined to be a type that satisfies the opposite universal property. So if I map into it from some c prime, then, uh, then that's the same thing as uh, um, as mapping into A and B and making sure that the square commutes. So, in other words, if I map from C prime into A into B, such that the square commutes, then uh, then I get a unique uh, edge from C prime to C, such that um, such I get an identification here. Um, this is just the opposite of the thing for uh, pushouts, uh, but we need pullbacks uh, uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, but uh, it's not so bad, they always uh, exist. We don't have to use higher inductive types. Uh, the reason they exist um, is you can consider a type um, of pairs A and A, B and B, such that F of A is G of B. So I have an element in A, I have an element in B, and I make sure that they map to the same thing in X. And the, uh, the type of all those elements is the, <coughs> is the pullback. And, um, um, and the reason this is uh, the pullback is because pi distributes over sigma. Um, so we should prove the universal property of this thing. So we map into it from some other type X and we say, ah, okay, we have a map into a sigma. Uh, that's just um, mapping into each of the parts. So um, mapping into A, mapping into B and such that some, uh, something holds and that something is precisely the commutativity of that square. That's just what falls out. Um, I think maybe you did distributivity of pi over sigma in some proof assistant. Maybe or maybe not, um, but it's uh, it's that fact. Um, 
I don't recall if we defined the fiber of a map in this week. Um, so I put it here again. Let f from a to b be a map. Let b be a point in b. Then the fiber of f at b is the type of points in a that map to b. <coughs> There's the sigma type. And um, because of, um, of this definition of the pullback, um, we can now look at a special case where uh, the unit type appears here in the bottom. And when we go back and we put the unit type here, it's contractible, then something contractible appears here. We can just get rid of it. And we get this sigma b and b. Um, so this f is now this point such that the point x is uh, g of b. That basically is the fiber, but the identity type is reverse now, but it's still equivalent. <clears throat> so um, we get uh, we get the pullback uh, square like that. And even a uh, more special case would be where A is here, A is also the um, unit type, then, um, then this, uh, this A would cancel. And the only thing that would remain here is the identity type. So identity types actually can be obtained as pullbacks or satisfy the universal property of a pullback also. That's something interesting. Um, there's an important term about pullbacks. <clears throat> if I have a commuting square, um, then I can look at the fibers of these maps uh, P prime and this map uh, P. And because uh, the fibers are pullbacks uh, by the universal property of pullbacks, there's a unique map that goes from this fiber to that fiber. And, um, and then we say uh, this, uh, this square here is a pullback square if and only if those maps are equivalences. So that kind of means that um, I can view P as the family of fibers here. I pull it back along F, <clears throat> then I get um, uh, then I get the substitution. And if it's a pullback, it must be the case that these fibers here are equivalent to the fibers of P prime. Um, so the reason why pullbacks are important is because they are related to fiberized equivalences. Again, the, the notion of fiberized equivalence comes up. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, because this relation between pullbacks and fiberized equivalences, usually um, if you do a course on category theory, the first thing you have to show about pullbacks is that if I put another pullback square here, then uh, then, uh, then the large rectangle will be a pullback. That's going to follow immediately from this um, from this uh, condition here, because we just compose two fiberized equivalences, and they will again be a fiberized equivalence, and therefore it's trivial. Whereas if you do it categorically, then you have to sweat a little bit because you have to prove uniqueness. <clears throat> okay, now uh, here is a big hammer. Uh, from higher category theory that um, that is true in um, in hot. <clears throat> if we have a commuting cube, uh, so we have all of these maps, all the squares commutes, and there is even an interior um, a homotopy that connects all of these six um, all the six squares with each other. <clears throat> And uh, and then in the bottom square, we want that this is a push-out square. And the back two squares, we uh, have the condition that they are pullback squares. And uh, then the descent theorem says that the following are equivalent. Um, the one condition is that the top square is a push-out square. And if that is the case, then um, then the two squares in the front will be pullback. And to remember um, that this is something about uh, fiberized equivalences. Um, do I make a point? No, I'm not going to make a point about that. That's how you prove descent is true fiberized equivalences. <clears throat> um, but the other way to use it is uh, to say, ah, okay, I know that I have. Um, 
uh, pullbacks here. So my top square must be a push out square. That's actually how we most of the time use it, I think. Um, do I have an application? Yes, the hop vibration. So let's uh, yeah, let's use um, let's use the descent theorem to prove uh, construct the hop vibration. Uh, in the bottom uh, square here, I have S1 and these two maps into the unit type. And if I take the push out, that was our definition of S2 because that's the suspension of S1. So that's by definition, this square here is a push out square. And um, what else? <clears throat> also, um, I put S1 cross S1 here. I take the two projections and I take the push out. That was our definition of the join. If we take the two projections out of a product and we take the push out, that's the join. And remember that we said that S1 join S1 is S3. And this is a push out. It satisfies the universal property. So there's a map here. And, um, <clears throat> and here from S1, cross S1, there's a third way to come back into S1, uh, namely the multiplication operation that we defined in lecture one. Um, and this multiplication operation, if you remember, was that uh, in such a way that uh, when I fix an X, then, um, then this mu will be an equivalence. So multiply, multiplying from the left by X is an equivalence and multiplying from the right by y is an equivalence for each x and for each y. But that means uh, that we have here fiber-wise equivalences. So for each x, um, this mu of x going from the fiber here, which is just as one, to the fiber here, which is just as one, um, is going to be an equivalent. So this square, by the condition that this uh, mu's are uh, equivalences, <clears throat> is a pullback square. And the same thing here. I use a second projection, so multiplication on the right must be, um, must be an equivalence. But because it's an equivalence for every y, it follows that this square on the back is a pullback square. So we're exactly in the situation where, um, where you can apply the descent theorem, where the two squares in the back are uh, pullback squares. In the bottom, we have a pushout square. In the top, we have a pushout square. So um, uh, we conclude that the front two squares are pullback squares again. But um, remember that, um, that uh, the fiber was a pullback and that was the case where it uh, went to one in one of the corners. So now we're gonna use that. So we have this pullback square, I just singled it out, S1 to uh, S1 join S1 going into S2. Um, so I have this map here and its fiber is gonna be exactly S1 because uh, this pullback is always a fiber. Um, and in general, uh, we will say that the fiber sequence is a sequence of pointed maps like that, that fit into a, push up, uh, into a pullback square. So that's really uh, F is the fiber of that map. That's why they are called fiber sequences. And uh, okay, so we have a fiber sequence from S1 to S1 join S1 going into S2. We recall that S1 join S1 is S3. And therefore we have fiber sequence from S1 to S3 to S2. And this thing is called the hop vibration. It is uh, a vibration over S2 with fibers in S1 uh, such that the total space is S3. Uh, this is a really famous construction from Hopf in, I think, the 30s. Uh, and it's constructed in uh, just using um, uh, methods from higher category theory, just the descent property. We use the multiplication operation on, uh, on S1 and, uh, and hit it with descent and we get it. And there are not that many uh, of this kind of vibrations. There's only uh, one higher one, there's uh, one lower one too, um, that uses uh, the multiplication on S3 
remember that S3 is this uh, type of unit elements of R4, which you can see as the quaternions because those are four dimensional. So it's the unit quaternions, they can be multiplied and, um, and you stay on the unit sphere if you multiply two elements on the unit sphere. So S3 has another multiplication that can be used in the very same way to get the quaternionic hop vibration, but this one is much harder to, to construct. And no, there is um, no vibration S7 to S15 to S8. This is, uh, this is where it stops. And, and that's because, um, uh, is there not? Wait. Uh, sorry, I'm blanking a little bit. <clears throat> there might be one more, yeah. Um, yeah, I think there, there might be. Okay. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, thank you, uh, Elias. I hope I say your name correctly for, for this, uh, this remark. Um, I'll fix my slides and um, hopefully the editors will uh, fix what I say on, on the recording. <laughs> um, I have some exercises here that are about simple cases. Um, uh, P and Q are propositions now, so that's much simpler then you can show that p join q is actually the same thing as the disjunction of p and q so this is a nice nice exercise for which you don't uh, need too much technology so i recommend this um, and similarly if p is a proposition then you can look at the suspension of p and uh, this will be a set and you can show that in this suspension the type north equals south is equivalent to p and the last one is asking if I have um, that A is a proposition if and only if the map into the self join is, a, is an equivalence. Um, uh, thank you for the extra references, Gabriel. Um, I, uh, I, I also have here some open problems. I saw that they were already discussed. Um, yeah, so there is an octonionic hop vibration. And the thing, the reason why I said no was that. Um, um, that uh, um, S7 is not deloopable, but that's a different problem. <clears throat> uh, so here the open problem uh, um, that you can try if you uh, are doing oops, PhD on this subject is to define the Grossmanians or try to define a type X such that its loop space is S3. Um, and uh, remember that I said that pi distributes over a sigma. Another open problem is to find out how pi distributes over homotopy co-limits. This will be very interesting also, but it's also hard. Um, 